Okay, trig functions. Now, if you get confused anywhere along the way, I think I'm going to explain this beautifully, but if there's a piece I'm missing somewhere along the way, if you're like, oh, I don't get that example, I don't get what he's trying to get at there, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be able to do there, just let me know right away because I don't want to uh, zip past this. Even It's my only lesson of the day and I want to get it right. Yeah? Trigonometric functions, reviewing and extending a little bit. So this is a little more than was in, in advanced functions. It starts off reviewing the stuff in advanced functions, then it goes a little farther. Radian measure. There's the picture for radian measure. It tells you exactly what's going on. It says, okay, if you want to know the arc length around the outside of a circle, and you know the radius and the angle, the relationship is theta equals A over R. I've got to tell you, that's not the way I memorize it. I like this version of it. It's the exact same but that's the version of it I memorize. The reason I like that one so much is it fits right together with the, the circumference formula you learned back in grade seven, eight, nine. Let's just plug the circumference formula in here. If you want all the way around the circle, you want circumference. If you want radius, okay, radius would be the radius of the circle. And then the angle all the way around the circle is two pi. Do, do, can you see that? We were doing radians back in grade seven, eight, nine. We didn't even know it. It told us that to find the circumference of a circle, you multiply two pi times the radius. And we just went, oh yeah, sure, sounds good. But that's really what radians is all about, is saying, okay, now we can use any angle you want. If you don't want to go two pi all the way around the circle, you want to go pi, you want to go pi over two, you can always find the arc length, this part right here. Huge applications uh, as we move through all this stuff. The basic version of this question, though, is for a radius of 15th and arc length of 70, determine the central angle theta. And however you remember the formula, again, I remember it as A equals R theta. That's how I memorize it. Maybe you memorize it as theta equals A over R. You'd find this question a little easier. They want the central angle. So theta is the arc length divided by the radius. Really, theta is just telling you how many radii you've gone around the outside. That's all that you're really uh, figuring out here. And so arc length was 70, radius is 15. Seventy over fifteen, let's see, uh, can I reduce that in my head? Fourteen over three. Or as a decimal, four point six seven. I've gone to two decimal places, you know, in a test or a quiz. I'll either mention how many decimal places to go to or you can ask me. 4.67 radians. Radians is very weird. You won't be exactly familiar with it. When you talk about degrees, it's easy to go, oh, degrees. If I say 100 degrees, you go, oh, that's around here. Oh, if that's 300 degrees, oh, that's about this much. Radians won't be quite, come quite so easy for you. So a little picture to remind you about radians. There's an important picture of radians. That's pi radians to go halfway around the circle. But when it says pi, it takes on this mystery, like somehow, oh, what's pi? Pi's not that exciting. It's 3.14. So when you go around, halfway around a circle, you want to go 180 degrees. In radian measure, it's 3.14. Now, then people see it and they go, well, why are you making it so confusing? Well, everything's confusing, right? Miles to kilometers, liters to gallons. Everything has a conversion rate. This is just the conversion rate for radians and degrees. Rewind one more step. Wasn't degrees awesome? No, degrees wasn't awesome. Degrees was just something somebody made up and they said, oh, it seems like there's 360 days in a year. We'll make 360 degrees in a circle. And you learned it so much, you think, oh, this is great. It's awful. Radians has this wonderful formula where you can exactly find out how far around a circle just using radian measure. Now, there's other applications. There's more to the story. It's time, you know, during online learning it was like, okay, well, I didn't really like radians, good. It's time to switch over and go, radians is the superior measure for doing English, or sorry, English, engineering, science, these type of things. Is it more, is it easier? Well, no, because you've been doing degrees since you were seven, eight years old, so of course you think degrees is awesome, yeah, okay. This question does ask us to convert to degrees though, so I wanna show that off. So to convert to degrees, we take our 4.67 radians and we multiply by the conversion factor, just like you would for gallons, 
to liters or centimeters to meters or inches to yards or you know whatever you're converting and the conversion here is I want to go over to degrees so it's 180 degrees for every pi radians. Does this ring a bell? This is the one thing in online learning I think we sort of beat on a little bit was how to convert back and forth. Then your calculator can take you the rest of the way. 4.67 times 180 divided by pi. Oh, I may as well, while I'm at it, I may as well get, I'm going to need it later in this lesson, so I may as well get the same calculator as you up on the screen. Because I do want to talk about one thing here. What is it about this question, and this question may just boggle your mind, I, I, I totally get it, but what is it about this question that makes me not have to worry about being in radian mode? I want to establish this right now. When do we have to worry about being in radian mode or not, or being in degree mode? What types of questions or what has to be in the question before I care about any of that stuff? The calculator, I'm going to go 4.67 times 180 and divide by 3.14. I don't need the calculator to be in radian mode to do that. That calculation is the same in radian mode or in degree mode. I'm like, but you're doing degrees and radians here. I'm like, yes, I am. And the calculator can do all that. There's only one time it needs to know. One type of button, I'm leading you to it. One type of button you might press for the calculator to know, is this, ca is this angle coming in degrees or radians before it makes its judgment? Yeah, yeah, th that's, th that's what I expected. I'm not surprised you. It's, it's a little weird. The only time the calculator needs to know whether you're talking about degrees or radians is if you hit sine, cos, or tan. Those are the ones where it goes, I'm taking your angle and I'm converting it to a ratio for you, or I'm taking a ratio and converting it to an angle. It needs to know what measurement you're putting in there. The rest of the time, this doesn't really matter. I mean, if you're worried, but you might go, okay, I've got to be in degree mode for this. It won't change the answer. You get the same answer in degree or radian mode. It's only if you go to hit sine, cos, or tan. So for me, when I'm doing, working with a calculator and so on, whenever I go to hit sine, cos, and tan, that's the moment where I go, it triggers me. I'm about to hit sine, cos, tan. Whoa, hang on. Am I in degrees? Am I in radians? What am I working with here? Yeah? Okay. Anyways, 4.67 times 180 divided by Hi. Oh, 18. Equals 268 degrees. Usually we do degrees to the nearest hole because degrees are really small. To round off to decimal degrees, wow, that is tiny. And usually we do two decimal places on radians. That's usually what it'll say in your quiz and test. And if, if you don't, if you aren't sure which what to round to, it's usually two for radians and, and nearest degree is usually fine for degrees. I'd l if you have to convert to degrees to get an image of what angle you're talking about, that's fine. But I'd like you to get to the point, give it a try, that, hey, this is about three. So 4.67 is, uh, you know, over here somewhere when you, when you want to get a feel for where it is. Use this picture as picturing radians. If you have trouble picturing radians, just always go back to that. That'll give you a, a start of what where radians fits into this whole thing. Any questions about that? I'm hoping that really rings a bell. Like, because we, we I, I really try to focus on that during advanced functions. Oh, and this is supposed to be something between grade 11 and 12 that is all pretty familiar. This is all in radians, which is new uh, from in grade 12. Uh, but these are the basic graphs of sine, cosine, secant, cosecant, tan, and cotan. It is assumed, after advanced functions, that you can produce those graphs whenever you want to. Yeah? Let me take a second on that, though. If you were a regular advanced functions class that wasn't, didn't do it online, I might right now just go, okay, you know these. Here, study them up, and I'll see you later. But I want to spend just a couple moments on this. If it's like, no, those aren't right ready for me in my brain, how do I get them if I forgot one? Here's what you do. Any calculator, you don't need the fancy Casio calculator to get a couple of points. I'm presuming that at least when I say sine and cosine, your brain is at least going, well, I know it does this. Yeah? If you're not that far, well, okay, we're in real trouble. Yeah? We, we've got to, got to do some serious review. If you know it does this, but you don't remember exactly what the, the values are, well, it's, it's not hard to do. You, you make sure you're in radian mode. 
uh, menu one, and then on this calculator you go shift menu, and I'm in rad mode right now. If you weren't in d rad mode and you wanted to switch to degrees, you got to go down here and press the F1 key and it goes to degrees, F2 back to rad. Okay, so I'm in, I'm in radians here. And let's say you're trying to remember, okay, cosine, where does cosine start? I know it, it's got to go up and down, but where does it start? Well, you just go cos zero. I mean, it's not the most optimum thing that you don't have cosine memorized, but it doesn't take long to f figure out where cos starts if you've got any scientific calculator. So even you head off to university and they steal this calculator from you, maybe they'll even steal calculators like that from you and say, you can only use this. Bella ran into that at Waterloo. Well, they said, this one only. Still had sine cos tan on it. Cos of zero is one. Now you know this point right here. And you know where cosine starts. And maybe that's enough to go, oh, I know the rest. Here I go. Okay? Maybe you forgot. And you're like, I forget in radians how long it takes to go back up and down. Well, you just start punching in some values. Not optimum. This will be slower than you want to be to do one of these. And you type in cos pi over 2, 0. And maybe now that's enough to trigger your memory about cosine and go, oh, yeah, I remember what's going on here. So the basic graphs of sine, cos, and tan with any scientific calculator, even if you forget, a couple of seconds later you should be good. Okay? Now, secant, cosecant, and cotan, I didn't focus too much on them in your advanced functions. I just mentioned them and then had one on the assignment to try to imply, geez, you're really supposed to know these. How do you get from here to here? Well, you've got to know your basic, basic trig identities. And here they are. Secant is 1 over cos. Cosecant is 1 over sine. And cotan is 1 over tan. The whole trig toolbox? No, I memorized? No, not yet. Sometime soon, maybe. But those three, we got to have those three. That's that's actually from grade 11. So if you're in your mind going, okay, what am I supposed to know here from advanced functions for this chapter? Boy, got to get these three memorized. Let me tell you how I memorized them. 20. Oh, I'm scared to calculate this now. What I would have been. You guys are 17? So if I memorized them when I was 17, 30 years ago when I memorized these. Well, I didn't have to memorize cotan and tan. I know, what, what a great naming for cotan and tan. Yeah, they, it's pretty obvious. Tan, cotan, yeah, okay. These ones, I just memorized that co, the two coses don't match up. That was the end of the memorization right there. Cosine and co, wouldn't it be nice? It would have been easier if cosecant and cosine matched up, but they don't. You're like, if I was doing it, I would have made them match up. Well, there's more to the story than these. These names actually do mean something. Sine, cosine. There's something to the naming here, and it doesn't come up until, depending on what you're taking, usually second semester calculus in university, there's this awesome lesson where all of a sudden there's this great diagram that comes and goes, see, this is the tangent. You've seen tangents, and you're going to see more tangents. I'm going to be all over you with tangent in the next month or so. And then in the diagram you go, oh, and so this is the cotangent. You go, oh, that's why it's named like that. It wasn't just to torture high school students. There's a reason these names exist. It's just not clear yet. Same with sine, cosine, cosecant. Oh, there's the secant. Oh, there's the cosecant. Yeah, and it all makes sense at that moment. But for now, it's just sort of this m mystery memorization that you have to do, right? Okay. So back to the graphs. How do I use this to get from here to here? And it's actually very, very nice. The zeros of cosine... And these aren't lined up very well. I don't like how these are lined up. The zeros of cosine are the asymptotes of secant because you're going one over. And the ones that are here become ones there as well. See? So it all lines up. So you should be able to go right from a cosine graph to making a secant graph. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm old. Maybe I'm lazy. I'm not sure I have cosecant and secant memorized. I'm not sure if you ask me to draw a cosecant, whether I, draw, whether I go up and just draw them, or whether I'm going to go cosine, secant. It might look like I have them memorized, because I'm that fast at switching over, but I think I come right from these graphs to these graphs. When I need a graph of cosecant or secant, I first draw the cosine or sine, at least in my head, 
and then use that to draw the graph. And I, I suggest that same strategy for you until you get to the point where you feel like you need to memorize secant and cosecant. Zeros become asymptotes. Other points, you just go one over them. One over one becomes one. One over one, the one over negative one becomes negative one. You get th those points come pretty pretty quickly. Other questions about converting between those two types of graphs? So it says state the period of sine and cosine. Two pi. I'm hoping that is as soon as I write it, it's like yes, two pi. State the period of tan. Tan is different. Tan's period is only pi. It only takes pi radians before tan starts to repeat. State the range of sine and cosine. I'm going to use the fancy interval notation only because there was questions on it last week. So obviously the interval notation didn't take. Interval notation is wonderful for domain and range and things like this. For range, you just go, oh, lowest y value, highest y value. And I use square brackets because negative 1 and 1 can be included. You can write it like this. They want range, right? Range. Y element of reals such that negative 1 is less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to 1. Yes, I know all about this. But this is way better. Yeah, isn't this way better? It looks like a point. There's a couple people in the homework. I just thought they just, they wanted domain and range and they just wrote a point. This isn't a point. They know, it was a range, so we knew it wasn't a point coming. This is an interval. Domain of secant. Stay in the domain of things with regular asymptotes every so often is very, very difficult when you first see it. Once you see what I'm trying to accomplish, it's pretty straightforward. So the domain, uh, here we go. X element of reals such that X cannot equal. Now look at secant. X can't equal pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, 9 pi over 2, 11 pi over 2. I'm not making a list. That's not what I'm going to do. Even worse, it goes negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi. There's all of these things. that Making that list is, is, is kind of awkward. So pick one. Start with one of them. Say, okay, the first one I see is pi over 2. And then decide how often you see them. How far away is the next one? You go from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. How far have you gone? I'll let you chew on that for a couple seconds. It's real easy if you're good at radians. If you're not good at radians, it seems like the hardest question of the day. How far is it from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2? You're tired? You're beat after a, a long week of whatever easy class you had outside of this? Or you don't know? And the reason I ask that is because my explanation is different. If you really don't know, I, I, want you, I, I want you to know, and I want to explain it in such a way that you go, oh, I get that now. How many think they know but don't feel like answering? How many don't know? Give me the thumbs down like, I have no idea what you're saying. Okay, here it comes. This is how you manage radians when you're first learning. Hopefully at some point it becomes so entrenched that you don't need weapons like this. But take a look at this. Here's the scale in radians. We usually go by pi over 2 because those are convenient numbers. It's the same reason we went by 90 degrees when we were doing sine and cosine originally is because that's when interesting things happen. Every 90 degrees interesting things happen with sine and cosine. It's every pi over 2. So let me just count by pi over 2's. Pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 6 pi over 2. That's very easy to understand. I'm just counting by pi over 2's. Here's where it messes you up, is the fractions. It's, it's fractions that's actually messing you up here. Because every second pi over 2 reduces, and when you see 2 pi over 2 written on the screen there, it's not pi over 2. 2 pi over 2 is pi. This is 2 pi. This is 3 pi. And you see how that messes up your brain, and it's hard to calculate how far away these two things are. So, 
pi over twos, two squares, one whole pi. Now I ask my question again. How far is it from pi over two to three pi over two? Veronica? Pi. If she had said two pi over two, I think I would have jumped up and down in excitement and went, yeah, two pi over two, great answer. But we're not gonna say two pi over two. We're gonna say that's pi. It's half a circle, essentially. What was I working on there? Oh, so where are the asymptotes for secant? There's one at pi over two, and then they happen every pi. So you say, okay, if you wanna know where the asymptotes are, you go pi over two plus pi, and I'll use k, because I think that k was the one that was most commonly used in advanced functions, even though n is the letter you'll most often see moving forward. I can't really remember in your advanced functions textbooks now whether it was k or n. But they're, all they're saying is then go pi however many times you want. You can go twice, three times, and every time you do it, you'll find another asymptote. Now, you do have to mention that the k is an element of the integers. I'm going to use i for integers. Sometimes you see z used for integers as well. Question. Ah, by saying it's a, uh, integers, then I, I, I free myself from that positive and negative thing. But you're, you're right, though. Having plus minus in there is important. But saying it's an integer means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. I glossed over that in advanced functions, too, because I didn't think it was essential to understanding the trig. You know, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll pick that up in September when I need it. Yeah. State the range of cotan. Where's cotan? Oh, the range. Cotan goes forever, up and down. So if I'm going to do range using interval notation, I would go negative infinity to infinity. I really like that. That's how I like saying the ranges. But you're not stuck with it. If you like this instead, uh, range for cotan, range, uh, oh, just y element of reals. And state the functions above that show even symmetry. It means it's the same on the right of the y-axis as there on the left, just a mirror image. Uh, y equals cos x is even. Sine is not, you see, when you flip it over here, it's not the same on this side. Tan, no, it's not the same over there. Oh, secant is, well, c cosine is, so of course secant would be as well. Cosecant, no. Cotan, no, they're not the same on either side. Odd and even does come up on the test. Yeah, I did ask an odd even question. Questions about the graph of those trig functions? More time on this slide? I'm happy to be back teaching you guys because I trust you. I trust you to tell me what I'm doing wrong or to correct me when I make mistakes on the board. I spent a week with the grade nines and we don't just, <laughs> we're getting to know each other, eh? We don't trust each other quite yet. I made a mistake on the board and it took them three slides to, for someone to build up the nerve to put up their hand and say, Mr. Todd, I think it was a seven. You know, I had to go all the way back. It's really fun there. They're very young and very, very energetic though. Boy, it's good. Okay, a brief investigation for discussion. Use your calculator to graph the relations shown. Okay, here's a review of this. If you had trouble graphing parameter, using parameters, Hopefully, actually, I talked to a couple people who were zipping around their calculator. I know Simon, when he was pushing the buttons, he was pushing them faster than I probably push them now. Like, I, I still look at the screen and go, okay, where is it? Because I, I don't have loads of experience. I know where the stuff is, but I don't have tons of experience. If you guys have been playing with them and you guys have been working with them, you probably know where the buttons are and things are going a lot faster now. Why I tell you about that is not to show off for Simon, just to let you know you will get there with the calculator where it's like, okay, bang, bang, bang. We're going to be using this thing all year, so. Graph the relations parametric equations. I'm going to go slow and careful. I'm going to pretend like you completely forgot how to graph parametrically. So, I go to the menu and I look around for graph. I don't memorize the key sequences here. I just look for what I'm after here. In this case, I want graph. And these are 
parametric equation, so I don't want y equals. Well, I do want y equals. But I also want x equals. That's the thing about parametric equations. There's an x equation and there's also a y equation. So, here I go. I need to change the type of graph and right there, type. And under it, F3. So I hit F3 to go to, ah, there it is, parm. You know, so I switch to parmesan graphing here. And then you see the ex equations have changed. X, T, Y, T, X, T, Y, T. It, it switches. It goes, oh, I know what you're going to do. You can do parametric equations. And it said do cos t sine t. So here I go. Cos t execute sine t execute. And then the second graph they wanted me to do was just t with sine t. Enter. Now. Before it mentioned there, it says make sure simulgraph is on. Now, simulgraph is tough to find. There's nothing on a test or an exam that's going to make you do simulgraph. You know what I mean? So, uh, if you're making a list of things that you have to know how to use on the calculator, don't put simulgraph on there. Simulgraph is just for this example, okay? Simulgraph is found in setup, but you've got to be in here before you get to that kind of setup. In the graphing setup, so there's a different setup in there. So, if I hit shift menu there, I get that graphing setup menu and down there you'll see simul graph mine is off it wants it on <coughs> so to turn it on it's weird how you have to turn it on I wish you could just press enter to switch it but you don't if you press F2 it'll turn off if you press F1 it'll turn on see these menu buttons match up with the F buttons here so F1 simul graph is now on apparently they wanted that to happen now I've done this before so I know you got to watch, because what happens, happens very quickly. I can get it to repeat it, but it happens very quickly. So for now, instead of looking at your screen, look at mine, and watch what happens on the screen, because it, 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 it's gone before you, ready? Here you go, drop. Did you see how fast that went? Yeah? Now, I know how to, I've played around with it now, so I can make it redo it. So if you want to see it redo it a few times, hit zoom, and then either go zoom in or and just zoom anything. Like any, you redo the zoom. <coughs> and I'm going to do zoom in. I'm going to put the center there. And if I zoom in, I get the graph again. And then maybe I want to see it again. Do it enough times where you're like, oh, I see what's happening here. It takes a few. It's so fast. Yours might even be faster than mine. What it's trying to model and what this example is trying to do is when a Ferris wheel goes around, what the graph of height would be. So as you go around on a Ferris wheel, and you, if you graphed your height, this is what would happen. And I was thinking a lot about this example today because of the date. It's September the 21st. Now, th I'm very cognizant of the amount of sunlight that's out there because I have little kids. And there's two important features of sunlight when you have little kids. One is bedtime. They're very freaked out when you try to put them to bed when the sun's still out in the spring. You know, because they're like, what, what, what's going on? What are you trying to do to me here? Like, they feel ripped off, you know, because there's more and more sunlight. But in the winter, it gets a little easier. The other thing is how much warmth we have outside for playing outside. If you graph the amount of sunlight over the years, over the year, what happens is you get a beautiful perfect sine curve for amount of sunlight. And I got to tell you today, isn't today day, September the 21st? This was uh, June 21st. This is the amount of sunlight you get on June 21st. And what's sad about this day is this is the day where the amount of sunlight changes the most. We're right here. We're losing the most amount of sunlight we're going to lose every day now. You know, like tomorrow's going to be less sunlight and less sunlight. And then it starts to slow down around December 21st. The days around December 21st are all about the same length. They don't change all that much in that section around December 21st. Why do I bring that up? Because this, this graph here is, is hard to understand why, how going around on a Ferris wheel can be modeled by a sine curve. And it has to do with, just think about riding a Ferris wheel. When you're coming up the side of the Ferris wheel, 
yeah, you're right on the edge up here, that's when you're rising the fastest. When you're moving up the fastest. If you look out, I know there wasn't any Ferris this year, but when you look out from a Ferris wheel, out the side of the Ferris wheel, that's when you're moving up the fastest. When you get to the top, you're not actually moving up that much. You see, there's a lot of time at the top where you're sort of just at the same height. You know, every, those top three cars are basically all at the same height. You know, but these top th these three cars along the side, they're at very different heights. You know? And that's how this circle can result in this graph, is that at the top you sort of level out for a while, and then as you're coming down, fast, 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 and then it slows down again. You don't slow down. How much you're going up or down slows down. You're, you're going around like this, so you're going the same speed the whole time. Yeah? That's just a cool little thing. N not, not a big point to be made there, but just a cool thing. Quick. Oh, can I take a look? Oh, uh, cos t sine t, and then it wanted the second graph to be t and, what was it, t and sine t? Sine t draw. Oh, still didn't want to do it. And that tells me something it's thinking. So I don't know what's going on, but it's got, so what I'm going to do is just suggest that when stuff like that happens, you go to system and go to reset okay. and reset the main memory. Yes. And then try it all again. Because some setting, probably with other stuff you were doing in the homework and so on, one setting's just off. And, there, and it's really hard to find the setting that's wrong. Okay. Try it again now. Go through all the steps and, and let me know. Because you really want to know how to do parametric graphs. Again, if you're having trouble with graphs again, don't forget that reset. Because when you're, when you're in with different graphs and you change settings, and then all of a sudden you go to do something else, something suddenly doesn't work. And then s system reset will really help. You can even call me over during a test and I'll reset your calculator and then you can try it all again if there's, if there's trouble. Yeah, yeah. It has to do with the, 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 z the window settings. So I'm going to go zoom and I'm going to get you into a square. And then you'll get the circle back. Imagine it like taking an, the screen almost like an elastic band and you've stretched it like this and now circles look like ovals, you know? Like, I wish they would lock the aspect ratio. Okay. Oh yeah, that's your T setting down here. You probably played with that for questions in the homework. See how it just goes zero to pi? Mm -hmm. So we want to go zero to at least two pi to get the full circle there. And then if we exit and draw, we should get the whole thing. Then you also want to go to zoom square because you're getting oval there. <coughs> Just one more. These calculators are not perfect. And compared to some of the stuff that you have on iPhones and iPads and so on, way better for zooming and everything like that. Here's the difference though. You can't use an iPhone and iPad on tests and exams for this course or for the AP Calc exam, but you can use this. So it's worth the investment to get, learn its little quirks. Yeah? Here's some very good trig friends. I don't know. The rest of the trig toolbox, I don't even know if I'd memorize it until you absolutely had to for a course somewhere along the way. But these six are handy stuff. You see sine of negative x? That's the same as negative sine of x. Let's go back to the graph of sine of x and not just make that sort of a fact. Let's make it an understanding. Take a look at the graph of sine. If you go to negative side, there's something that happens to sine. You get the exact same numbers except negative. And that's all that's saying is that if you take sine of a negative number, you get the same as if you take sine of the positive number, but the answers will come negative. This, this comes from the fact that sine is odd. That's all that's really saying is sine is odd. Well, cosine is even. So that's where that comes from is that if you look at the negative side of cosine, you're going to get the same answer as you do on the positive side of cosine. Like when you go to cos of pi over 2, you get the same answer as if you go cos of negative pi over 2. Well, it's both 0 on both sides. Maybe you're unimpressed. But look, cos of pi is negative 1. Cos of negative pi is negative 1. So cosine is even. You get the same thing on both sides. I remember it like, oh, cosine's even, like the same thing on both sides. But it really has to do with the exponent uh, that this acts like, and it acts like an x squared function. If that's weird, uh, it's going to take some time to get to know why cosine and x squared are so
closely related, but maybe you can see it here. Cosine, if it's related to a power, it's really related to x squared. Sorry about all that noise. I've got to get to the attachment for this thing. And then, so 10 is also odd, so that's where you get these facts. Now, these facts come from something different, and I only do one of them. It only takes one to show what I'm talking about. Let's rewind to grade 10 academic. And let's, I'll put up a question from grade 10 academic to motivate where these three things come from. Let's say in the homework, I put this question here. And one of the grade 10 academics goes, okay, I know what to do here. This is the adjacent side. This is the hypotenuse. Adjacent hypotenuse, Sakatoa, cosine. And they go, okay, so cos of 30 equals x over 5. And just stop right there. Hopefully, you know what to do to finish this question up. The person sitting beside them goes, uh, well, yeah, you could do it that way, but can't you do it this way? Um, I'm going to find this angle here. How do I find this angle here? If that's 30, what's this one? 60, because you just take the 90 degrees that you have left over here and subtract the 30, and you get 60 degrees, yes? So this other person goes, couldn't I do sine of 60? Would be opposite or hypotenuse would be x over 5. Wouldn't that be the same thing? So the two of them start comparing questions. They well, let me just check this out. Uh, let's get back into degree mode here. Degrees, exit. So this, this person types in cos of 30. And for their question, they're going to use 0.8660254038. And they'll get the right answer. The other person goes, oh, no, no, you got to use sine of 60. What, you're crazy, man. You, you set it up wrong. You've got to use sine of 60. Same thing. Cos of 30 is sine of 60. That's why math is not broken. You can do it either way. Take a look at the graphs. Cos of 30 is in here somewhere. See about there, 0.866. Sine of 60 is right about there. Oh, 0.866. Sine and cosine are the same graph. That's the big conclusion we're going to get to. The only thing that's happened is they've shifted it left or right. Those of you who are going on to physics, you won't even use cosine. You just use sine for everything you're going to do in physics. They'll call it sinusoids, and everything will be based on sine because like, what's the point of having two different graphs that essentially do the same thing? There is a point sometimes in math. There isn't in physics. You know, may as well just use one of these. Okay, back to here. But... If we were going to draw this diagram in grade 12, instead we draw this diagram and go, okay, we want to make this conclusion for any x. Any x you want to use, you can also use this angle here and switch from sine to cosine. This angle over here would be 90 minus x, except we think in radians. What's 90 degrees in radians? Pi over 2. This diagram much more helpful than you think. Yeah? Almost to the point where it's like, I hand out this test tomorrow, and on the top corner you just write this little diagram to go, hey, when my, uh, the fact that my rating measure isn't maybe as good as it could be because of COVID and everything like that, this thing bails you out. It's everything right there. There's 180 degrees. You want to know 90? Oh, that wouldn't be pi. That's half a pi. Pi over 2. So in our diagram, we'd write pi over 2 minus x, and that's where these all come from. Sine of pi over 2 minus x gives you the same as cosine of x. You can switch to the other angle as long as you switch to the other ratio. Works for cosine and tan and cotan because the opposite and adjacent switch, switch rules there. Okay? But powerful stuff in the middle of other questions. Questions about those? AP Calc last year when they had full advanced functions, I just zipped through this screen because they had been beat up with advanced functions, whereas you guys, I sort of, you know, like I just took it sort of easy. Hello there, how are you? More. <laughs> Help yourself. 
Oh, you're the opposite, right? You were grade, you were just a week of grade 12s, I know, and now you're a week of grade 9s. They talk to me now? Yeah, yeah, I was just saying that to these guys. Uh, or get new jokes. With me, no less. That's a two-part problem. Math all week with Mr. Todd is the best thing ever. Not just math all week, jeez. It's not like we've got to go slug through chemistry all week now. She mocked me last week, guaranteed, right? At some point. Did she not? Claim to be the best teacher ever or something? You can tell me. Good for you. Lying straight to my face. That's good. I like that. <laughs> That's when you know you're ready to be a parent. Get ready to lie. That's it. This is all on video. Your parents are going to watch it later and go, what? All right. Is this kind of okay? Just to frame it for tomorrow. There's nowhere on the test where I actually ask you to do this development. That's not where I'm going with this. I want you to get the trig. Yeah, I, I, when we get to trig questions that, I, that I'm like, oh, I chose that for the test, you'll know. You'll, you'll feel by the way I react to the question, the way I start explaining you, like, oh, this is what we need to be able to do. Yeah? Okay. There it is. Yeah? Got to be able to graph. Got to be able to graph. And here I, I put together about as tough a question as you can imagine for trig graphing. Here's the whole explanation. Sketch the graph y equals 3 cos half x plus pi over 2 minus 1 on the interval negative 4 pi to pi and state the following properties. Verify your sketch using the calculator. When it says stuff like that and verify your sketch, it means they want you to be able to do it by hand, but use your calculator to check the answer. You're like, oh, can't I just always use my calculator? And the answer is, eh, in this class, sort of. But there might be questions where the calculator, I don't know if you've seen the graph on the calculator screen, it's pretty bad. And getting actual information off it, you can get a feel for what's going on, but getting information off it is not fast. You know, you've got to know how to do these things, right? What's the initial number one holy cow problem with this equation? Hopefully this is entrenched. Will, what's the problem? Yeah, that one half needs to be isolated. Another way to say that is when we go to do graphing and transformations, the x really needs to be by itself. It can't have a coefficient on it. So really, right above this, as soon as you get given something like this, you don't have to read it any farther. You do something like this. I use square brackets because it helps me see what's inside cosine and sine. When I have two sets of brackets, two sets of round brackets really throws me off, but square brackets sort of solves my problem. I'll get back to what goes in the brackets in a second. I'll just write the rest of it, and then I've got to do some thinking. There's lots of ways to think this out. But in the end, I've got to put something in the bracket that when I multiply it by a half, I get pi over 2. You can think backwards, you can divide, you can do all sorts of stuff. Me, personally, I first take a shot at thinking, can I think it through? Can I just write down something here? And in this one, I really can. Half a pi is half a pi. You know, I, I don't know what else to say besides that. Now, these fancy words. I don't know if your grade 11 teacher used the words amplitude and period. Did they in grade 11? Oh, so that's really old news. Amplitude is how far it gets from the center. It's really the vertical stretch, but they're getting ready, you ready for physics here. Amplitude is how big the wave is. In, 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 in my case, I'm trying to keep the amplitude pretty high here, the amplitude of these waves I'm sending out to you. So they shake your eardrum a lot so you can hear what I'm saying. Period. Well, if you're making a list of things to memorize, this is one of the favorite, my favorite trig formulas everywhere, anywhere. Period is 2 pi divided by the k value. I hope I made a big deal about that in advanced functions in the notes. Wrote it in separate letters or something like that. Period is 2 pi divided by the k value. And here's the k value here. In physics, you actually call them K waves because it really leads you to what frequency you're talking about uh, of sound. In this particular case, it's just a handy way to deal with this. You don't need this formula. A one-half inside means a horizontal stretch factor 2, which means 2 pi becomes 4 pi. So you can think that way. This is just a handy, convenient formula to do all that work for you. So I've got to go 2 pi 
divided by one half, which is like two pi times two, the period here is four pi. If you're not sure how to use the period, don't worry, I'm gonna explain how to use the period. And then finally, phase shift, that's the one inside the brackets. We're gonna move pi to the, uh, hopefully we've beat this to death over the grades. Positive inside means pi to the left. Now, here are my steps to graphing. Different teachers may teach this slightly different, but I think this is a very good recipe. Decide on a scale. And I put a question mark because it might not be a perfect scale that I choose right off the bat here. But the, a good scale to start you're thinking of is just take the period and divide it by four. So here I get pi. The period suggests using pi as a scale. And I'll talk about why that is as I go to graph it. The only question mark is, does that match up well with the phase shift? Is a scale of pi gonna work good with the phase shift of pi? Yeah, that works out good. If that doesn't work out well, you're gonna have to choose something else that works well with the phase shift. Now what? Uh, oh, uh, write the scale on, yeah, okay. Um, they wanted four pi to pi. I'm just gonna stretch this out. So I'm actually gonna use for my scale on here, because of the graph they gave me, um, I'll use blue for writing on the scale here, is I'm gonna go pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. They asked me to go negative 4 pi to 4 pi, so I, I want to get all of that stuff in there. So I'm just going to go every second square. See, the scale isn't like a rule. You have to use this scale. It's like a guideline, like, here, make sure pi's are on there when you go to do your scale. Now, what I do when I'm doing these graphs is I first draw a little sketch that has the right amplitude and the right period. That helps me. If I try and do the phase shift with it at the same time, I get confused. If you're better than that, hey, good for you. So I use a light color. I found orange in the past is a color that when I write it on the screen, you can just barely see it. That's what I'm aiming for here. And when you do your first graph, do it in very light pencil. This is not the correct graph. It'll have the right amplitude and the right period. So here, it all comes together at once. Cosine, does cosine start at the top, in the middle, at the bottom? Where does cosine start on its graph? At the top, yeah. So I'm starting up at three. You see how that incorporates the amplitude? Instead of one and negative one, it's three and negative three. The period is pi. No, the period is four pi. So it takes four pi for cosine to get all the way back to its top again. So it's at the bottom at two pi. And can you see the orange dots, like barely? That's all I'm looking for, because those aren't the right dots. You want them really light, because they'll mess you up if you're not careful. Then you switch over, and in my case, I can switch over to a different color, and some people do on, the, on tests and so on. They go just to a different color. But for your purposes, you just need to be able to see on mine, because I gotta take all those points and move them pi left. So this is points gotta move there, and you're gonna go darker now, and go, these are the actual points I need. Take all those points I had before, and move them pi left. Then I connect them up. And there's these other dots sitting there, but they were just my thinking. This thing go says go from negative four pi to four pi, so then I use the pattern of points I got to finish off the rest of the graph. Hopefully, at least three quarters of that procedure is completely familiar to you. You're like, yeah, yeah, I sort of remember this. Question. Say it one more time. The minus one at the end. Oh, I didn't move it down one. Look at my list, I didn't, I completely forgot about that. Good, so it's gonna mess you up. Oh, watch what I can do on here. If that happens to you on a test or something like that, just use another color. And, and just move it all down one and just make sure you label it. I'll do that on mine. So what I should have done was go pi left and down one, yes? Pi left and down one. 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 
And those would be the ones I'd connect. And then I continue it out to Oops, I didn't go far enough down there. There. Then down to there. And back up to there. Yeah, something like that. Better? Good catch. Yeah? Verify using your calculator. So, get my calculator on the screen. And go menu graph, change the type, so watch out for this in the test if it, if it now changes to a y equals 1. Notice what happens here though, when you just switch to Cartesian, the old ones that I had in there stay at parametric. Brutal, so I got to delete those out of there, I don't want those in there. F2, F1, deletes all those out of there, F2, F1, there we go. Now I can have my y equals, what was it, 3 cosine Zero point five x plus pi over two. All of that minus one equals draw uh, menu one. Oh yeah, radians. Radians. Menu graph. Draw. There it is. And then you can verify your points and, and trace it and make sure that it, it comes out to the right thing, okay? Need to be in radian mode. Okay, to go to radian mode, go back to menu 1, which is the normal math screen, and then hit shift menu for setup. And down about the bottom there is, it'll either say angle rad or say angle degree. You got to go down there, and once you're there, actually hit the radian thing on your menu so it'll switch to red. Then you can exit out of there and go back. Okay. Any questions about graphing trig functions? Perform a regression analysis. This question is unbelievable in the amount of data you've got to put in there. Oh, the X, in, you got the X in the bottom there. Right, it's, it's a, that's why I use 0.5, like one half X, not one over two X, like the X is like separate, yeah, one over two times X. Because of this a crazy example, on, on, on the test I think I did choose that you had to do a regression analysis and I even gave the hint that you should use sine or cosine. And I didn't use this much data. So this is going to be a nightmare to type in. But I figured if we did a nightmare in class and the one on test was a lot easier, you'd survive it. So work through this with me. If you didn't do a lot of regression stuff in the homework, you definitely want to see this regression thing one time. Regression. Where do we find regression? I don't remember. I don't memorize these things. I know where they are. Okay, but you may want to. I, I don't have to write a test on it. Go menu. And you want two for stat. So let me just write that up here. Menu, stat. That's where we got to start. There's not a whole lot to memorize after that. It's pretty good after that. Once you get into there, things are pretty straightforward. The display on this calculator is weird, though. So let's st as I type, start typing in all these times, uh, really check out what your screen says because it's sort of weird. 0.000. .000 Nine one, and when I press enter, it immediately goes to scientific notation, which is difficult to look back on. So to check your data, you actually got to if I, if I go back there, you got to know what you're talking about here. And this nine point one uh, e to the zero four, which means that we've multiplied by negative exponent four times. Now, how much scientific notation have they done with you in in uh, science? Have you done much scientific notation? A lot. 
especially you physics, chemistry people. But if you've only got grade 10 science, then where are we? Oh, you should have something past grade 10 science now. Okay, so it, it should be good. If not, that's what, if you haven't seen too much scientific notation, 0 0.00091 in scientific notation just means we're writing it with a 10 multiplier and some exponent on there. So now we enter all this data in there. Take, take the chance here. Like, like I say, I think I did eight pieces of data. So you're not going to do all this in a test. But practice it now so that uh, tomorrow you, you know what you're doing. And then 0 0.00108. And I'll just shut up for a while and, and enter stuff. And you should do it too. And we'll see if we get the same stuff. I go right down the one column first. And then I do the other column afterwards. I find that faster. Oh, I just made a mistake. Zero, zero, two, three, four. Okay, good. Whoa, that was close. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I hope you're faster than me. I just finished the first column. Am I winning or losing? Losing. Yeah, good. You should be faster with your being able to type it in on yours. I'll try and catch up here. Oh, second column's faster, yeah?
it was when I was practicing this for class that I said to myself, eight pieces of data. Maybe it's nine pieces of data I used on your test. There's a regression one, all right? Not, but eight or nine pieces of data. I want and I kept, I didn't go crazy decimals like this. I kept it pretty reasonable. So there's the first instruction I put at the top of the screen here. If you, if you haven't been doing a lot of regression, did the homework ask for a bunch of regression though? Did, were you able to do some regression? In the, yeah, there was some, okay. Um, but if you didn't get to all that, here's the instructions basically. Menu stat, uh, no instructions as far as putting the data in. I, I hope that's pretty straightforward. And then across the bottom, you see it's graph, calc, test, int. Okay, I'm gonna hit calc here because that's what we wanna do is calc. And then REG for regression, yes? That's the really only instructions you need. The rest of it I think is pretty straightforward if you've done a couple of them. The question is what kind of regression should you do? And there's no good answer to that. There's no obvious answer necessarily. But trig, there's something about the data here that indicates this is probably a trig function. What is it that the data is doing that sort of indicates that trig might be a really good choice here? Move this out of the way for a second. What does the data do? Yeah, time pressure and just keep going time pressure all the way down the two cone. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these, the time goes That's the first column, pressure goes Second column, yeah? What does the data do that indicates that maybe trig's a good choice? Yeah, yeah, it starts at negative 0.8, it goes all the way up to something, then it starts coming down, then it goes back up, and then it goes down. If you can imagine a graph of this, some, this does something like this. I didn't leave it to chance on the test. I, I told you which regression to do. I said, you do this kind of regression. So, x median, x squared, x cubed, x to the power of 4, log, exponential, power, there it is, sine. So you've got to go into that second level of menu and hit F4, the rest is a cakewalk. It tells you everything you're going to need there. It tells you the A, B, C, and D. And just to make sure, okay, now it's easy to make a little mistake on the data. So just to make sure I have all the information I can to give you part marks. So if you're just a little bit off, then I, I ask for all the decimal places. Or I, I ask for like five decimal places. So when you write this out, you'd do something like this. You'd go uh, Y equals, they tell me the A. 0. Point, I'm going to do five decimal places. 0.59853. Did you get the same thing? If you got one sort of decimal place off, look through your data because maybe there's one little mistake you made. But like I say, if you put on your test 0. 0.59852 or something like that, I'm going to go, oh yeah. Yeah, you put a piece of data in there wrong, but you, you got it basically. Uh, back to the screen. Uh, sine. The B is 2479, 0.19297. Did you get that? X plus, notice there isn't factored out. There's just both in there the way we don't like it. Ooh, it wasn't plus, it was minus 2807. Minus 2807. Two bracket twenty six fifty two plus zero point two six five zero two. Did you get the same numbers as me? Yeah, good. If you didn't, we have a few of us that got the same numbers. Just check to make sure you enter the data right. You know, one little piece of data missing can can mess this thing up. Any questions about regression? Questions? Oh, okay. In the real world, what we, when we stop with the decimals, depends on what you're working with. Let's say it was number of sunlight hours. One decimal place is probably all you need. You know, or maybe two decimal places for number of hours. Um, if it was money, two decimal places. You know, so well, on the test, I told you, I said, give me five. And the only reason I ask for five on the test is just if there's a little mistake, I can, I can see, oh, all their numbers are pretty close. The fact that this one's off a little bit. I'm just trying to protect you by going five decimal places. K 
calc, regression, menu over to there, and then F4 for. There you go. Okay. Uh, you might also be asked to use this equation. Like I might say, oh, well, then at time 0 0.5, what's the pressure? And then you'd have to put 0 0.5 into this equation, type the whole thing in, and press equals, and find out the, the pressure for that certain time. Once you've got the equation, you should be able to calculate any pressure. If you didn't type in right, you're not going to get the same answer, no. Oh, he says if you hit graph then calc, you can see it right on the graph. Okay, so let me check that out. Back to menu two. I've got my, oops, exit out of there. If you hit, okay, so where's graph? Exit again. And again. Oh, graph, okay. When you've got your data in there, hit graph. Which one did you select? Just graph one? Yeah. Graph one. Ooh. Now you got a really good hint that it's sine or cosine. You didn't need to look at the table. Then do calc from there, he says. And when you do calc from there, you can draw it right in. That's the problem we had the last time, is that I didn't draw it first. Once you draw it, or graph it first, then do the calc, then you can drop, drop the graph right on there, and you can see what the curve's doing for you. It's giving you the, the mathematically best curve to match this data. Very good stuff. Any questions about that whole procedure? More time? I'm ignoring your break time, by the way. You've got the rest of the day to take breaks, all right? We, we need to knock down this trig lesson, so then wh whatever your break is supposed to be for grade 12s, I forget what the time is for grade 12s. We'll just make it up at other times, okay? The frequency of a sound wave is measured in cycles per second, or hertz. So in the middle of all this, you might be like, this, these are sound waves. Like, isn't normally, don't we normally talk about frequency, not period? And yes, it's true. And to get frequency, all you got to do is one divided by the period. Okay, so here, oops. 2479. From there, I got a K value of 2479. Which means if I wanted the period of these waves, I'd go 2 pi over the k value. 2 pi over 2479. And I've rounded off to the nearest hole here because I'm, I'm just trying to show you the procedure. So then I go back to my calculator and I go menu 1. 2 pi divided by 2479. Here's the period. 2.53 times 10 to the negative 3. That's how long it takes for these waves to repeat. It's a sound wave. They're fast cycles. Uh, when you hear a sound from a tuning fork, it's vibrating really, 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 really fast, vibrating your eardrum really, really fast. And so if you want the frequency, and this slide was thrown in here, not to get ready for a test question. It really, it really isn't. It's really to establish that we're really on our way to some big things here with sound waves and any kind of waves. And if you're wondering how frequency fits into it, frequency is just one over the period. Picture it this way. I tried to get to it on one of your, uh, on your test. It was one of the only questions that was universally not done very well. I said, oh, something about blood pressure. Do you remember this? Where I said, and I gave you the period, and I said, well, well, how often does the heart beat then? You know, and I said, and, and flipping that thing over was a challenge for people, and they went, well, how does, this, how does this work here? And basically, you're just going one divided by that. Uh, oh, I want an answer button here. I think it's on top of here. One divided by answer, and it's 394 hertz. And it asks, what musical note does that frequency correspond? I, I don't know. Uh, you'd have to look that up to see, but it would be like a, a G flat or something like that. You know what I mean? Like this would be a specific frequency that matches up with a specific sound wave. Okay. Again, not a test type question. 
more of a let's just make sure we know where all this is going. That this isn't just random math. This math is heading towards real concepts here. More time there? Back one slide. To get those numbers so you can try it again if you to type those in. Simon? 395, yeah, so I maybe rounded off a little bit different than you get. Good? This slide? Good? Okay, let's talk about inverse trig functions. And this is the toughest thing today, except it's so darn easy. Yeah? Uh, I'm going to skip ahead a slide and come back to this, okay? And you might want to draw everything I draw in here because I asked an inverse trig graphing question on the, your upcoming test. And I want to show you how to graph inverse trig functions easily. And I don't have graph paper on here because I'm not looking for an extended awesome graph. I want to really talk about why inverse trig is weird. There's a reason why it has to be weird. Let's talk about y equals sine of x for a second and really get to know y equals sine of x again and use that to talk about the inverse of sine. If you were just learning about sine, you might build a table of values. might have happened in grade 11. The first time you went to graph sine, said, okay, take a moment and plug in 0, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, and you, you, you graph the sine. We're going to do it with radians, okay? So here's the important angles to sub in. And I encourage you to make sure on your calculator, you know how to type these in and get these answers. Well, if you do type them in for sine, what you'll get is 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, and you'll get the graph of sine. I'm not getting carried away with graph paper and being really specific. I'm just going, what does sine look like? And sine goes from 1 to negative 1. It takes 2 pi to do a full lap. Oops. And if I've blown up your brain, I say everything on that lesson so far is really a review. This is new. Everything that's about to happen here. Zero, zero, pi over two, one, pi, three pi over two, two pi. Okay, that, that should have been the investigation and I think I got you to do this investigation during COVID with advanced functions and radians and said, okay, just punch them in one time to get used to what this looks like. Now, you know that this thing goes on forever, yes? So it does this and does this and keeps going like that. And it goes like this and comes back down and, and keeps going like that. I just want to draw that in the picture so we're clear. We can just keep going and putting angles in here. Now, I'm going to use the graph to answer a few questions. Really look at the graph. Don't look at the table for a second. Looking at the graph, what is sine of 3 pi over 2? No, it's not a trick question. You just go over and go sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. Okay. How about sine of negative pi over 2? Negative 1. How about sine of 2 pi? Zero. Hopefully you really know how to use the graph to do that. Now I'm going to use the graph to ask the inverse question. And this is where all the lights got to turn on now. Here's the time to crank your brain up for the first time really this morning. When does sine equal zero? Zero, pi, two pi. Do you see the difficulty of inverse trig? Finding answers for sine, where I give you the angle and get the answer, is, is real easy. You just go, oh, it's this. But there's a real infinite problem here when you're doing inverse. That's the first level of understanding I want you to have, is that doing inverse of sine is a problem. And there's a reason why it's a problem. It's, it's because sine isn't one-to-one. -one. It doesn't sort of fail the horizontal line test. It 
completely butchers the horizontal line test. And that makes it a big problem to do inverses. I pick any number you want. I pick, say, 0.5. And I say, when does sine equal 0.5? And you go, here, 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 here. Which one did you want? So we can either go after all the answers, and we will during this lesson, or we can restrict ourselves and say, let's do an inverse sine for just the part that is one-to-one. -one. And we grab a one-to-one -one section, and there's many choices, and mathematicians decided we will grab this little section of sine to do inverses on. We'll call that the primary answer. It's the one your calculator will give. And that's where the primary answers come from. So when someone says, give me the primary answer for when sine x equals zero, you just say zero. You don't get carried away with the other ones. We know the other ones are out there. We're not forgetting about those. But we're giving ourselves a section of sine to work with as our base. Doing that, here is the graph now quickly of y equals sine inverse of x, which will usually be called arc sine. And it's another one of those things where it's like, why arc sine? And it comes away later. Well, we'll do something with sine, you go, oh, that's the arc sine. Yeah, yeah, and there's a reason for the name. For now, it's just a silly memorization thing. And when you're asked to graph y equals arc sine or arc cos or arc tan, on the test, all you'll do is make your table of values for sine, and then you'll do this, and this, oops, that's not what I wanted, I want just the pen, negative pi over 2 is negative 1, and I've highlighted those, now, this is the big moment the confusing moment of this lesson, maybe. Why did I go to negative pi over 2? Why, why bring negatives into this at all? What is it about going to negative pi over 2? Why did I grab that section of the graph? Because there were many choices. But I grabbed that particular section. What is special about this section of the graph? It goes through the origin. That's one of the reasons it's special. When we're doing inverses, why not have the origin in there? Why not center it in the, in the middle? The second part is this section is one to one in this section. So I don't have to worry about getting those multiple answers. It's got everything. It's got negative one to one. It's got the full range, but it's only got one answer for each part. So then when I want to do arc sine, I just grab all these points and flip them. That's what inverses is all about. Negative one becomes negative pi over two. 0 becomes 0, 1 becomes pi over 2, and I get this weird looking graph for arc sine, which I'm going to start using that name immediately to get used to it. Arc sine goes from, on the x goes from negative 1 to 1, and on the y goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And I'll draw it in blue here. Starts at negative 1, negative pi over 2, goes to 0, 0, then goes to pi over 2, comma 1. If that seems completely weird, well, yeah. It's the reason it got saved up till AP Calculus. It's a little bit complicated all the reasoning that goes into coming up with the graph of inverse sine. Technically speaking, this graph would continue on upwards like that. Well, we don't grab all that because then it would immediately fail the vertical line test. So those graphs are out there, but when we talk about arc sine, we're really talking about just this section. Any question about that thinking? Well, the previous slide to that on yours has arc cos, arc sine, arc tan, and that's all I've done for each one of those is done the original graph and then flipped the points to come up with those graphs there. That is not a perfect explanation. You're going to have to work with these things a little bit. But I'm telling you, the only thing I asked in the test was I chose one of these, said, hey, show me. 
show me you got a feel for arc sine arc cos because we're going to do way more of it later. So for now I'm just going to be like, hey, just show me you have some clue on what arc sine arc cos or arc tan look like. I didn't even choose one of these crazy arc secant, arc cosecant, arc co cotan. I, I, went, I went for one of these. I want you to know one of those three graphs for the, for the test, okay? Questions there? Oh, and you probably have a zillion questions there. Well, let's not take questions there, actually. And not, and not to rush it, but you're going to have to get to know that a little bit. So give that a little bit of homework attempt first. Did that. I, I mentioned this, that it's, it's called arc sine. And here's two questions that you just have to be great at. And I'm not sure, I can't recall, it was way back in May when I did these with you online. I'm not sure this explanation was perfect. So here comes the perfect explanation on how to solve cosine equations. Two examples and then we're finally done the trig lesson. Cos x equals negative 0 0.3. Now, there were a whole bunch of questions that came out to special triangles. One over root two, root three over two, two over root three. And those are still out there. I'm aware of those. But generally speaking, the special triangles don't pop their head into everyday questions. You're doing a question with uh, frequency of a tuning fork and so on. You're not going to have special triangles pop up. Usually you're left with some random 0 0.3 like this. Here are the steps to solving one of these things. You first find the related acute angle and you use the cos inverse of the positive part of the angle because I just want the positive angle. I just want that first quadrant angle to work with. So you go back to um, just the positive part. If you're not sure why I just chose positive there, it wasn't a mistake, I'll show you why in just a second, why I, why I don't care about the negative part. Then I go to my calculator, I make sure I'm in radian mode. I am. And I literally just do cos inverse, cos inverse of 0 0.3, and I get 1.27. That's the related acute angle in radians. And here's the reason why I didn't care about the positive and negative. It's because I'm going to use the cast rule to figure that part of it out. I don't like where I've drawn that. I'm not going to draw something differently. I'm just going to draw it over on the side here to give myself a little more space. So if the question is still blurring, I don't know why you went from, uh, didn't use the negative here. Why didn't I use the negative? Uh, here, here, I'm going to deal with the negative now. Where is cosine negative? Quadrants two and three, she says. Beautiful answer. You know, she actually knows the numbers of the quadrants. And what I found when I did cos inverse of the positive is this angle right in here the related acute angle, the angle with the x-axis. So then to get the final answer, I need to know this angle all the way around. So my x value here is, ooh, how do I find it? Here's where we test your radian know-how. This angle, this part right here, is the angle I want but I know only the related acute angle, 1.27, what am I going to do to get the answer? Yeah, I, he said 3.14. You know, I, it's such a good answer. It, yeah, pi is like the answer. I, I get that. But by saying 3.14, he's starting to get it where he's like, pi adds some mystery to this, like somehow there's some kind of mystery about pi. There's no mystery about pi at all. Pi is 3.14. So here, this is angle in here is just pi minus 1.27 or 3.14 minus 1.27 and so I'll need my calculator for that 3.14 subtract 1.27 and if you use the actual pi button and you get a slightly different answer here a slightly different rounded answer that's fine then how about this one this is pi plus 1.27 Boy, I wasn't expecting, I thought that was going to take a lot more explanation. But maybe you did better with online learning than I feared. I feared that what was happening out there is you weren't learning it, you were 
doing the assignment and flipping back and forth and doing that. If you did that, then this is all going to seem mysterious and you're going to have to work your way through. Okay, that is a good answer. It's not perfect because there's a problem here. They asked for it between negative 2 pi and 2 pi, which is something I did not do in advanced functions, is to say, we want some more answers here. Not just these two answers, I want the ones that are between negative 2 pi and 2 pi. So we want to know, also, I'll do it in red, we also want to know this answer and this answer. That's not easy. That is not easy. To do that, I need negative pi minus another 1.27. That's weird. And here I'll need negative pi plus the 1.27. Very strange. You also could just subtract 2 pi from both of these. That would also work. They just say, oh, I want to go back 2 pi radians to the, the other answer. So this is negative 4.41. And this is negative 1.87, I believe. Not a surprise that it just worked out to be the negative versions of that, because it's cosine. Cosine's even. Does most of that procedure ring a bell? I'm getting some nods, which means it is possible to know all that at this point with the, the COVID lessons and, the, and what I've taught you so far. Definitely, I walked right up and asked. I consider this a simple one, a, a pretty straightforward one. Definitely asked something just like that on the test. And, th and there's practice ones definitely in the, the homework and in the review. They wanted the answers between negative 2 pi and 2, and 2 pi. Not just from 0 to 2 pi. That's what I went after the first time. They wanted the negative versions of the answers going this way instead. So I had to do some thinking about how to get to that terminal arm in the negative direction. Okay. One more. Last example. I can see in your eyes. I've done as much as I can do, so I'll do this one fairly quickly. Cosecant at 1.7. There isn't a cosecant inverse button on your calculator, so you've immediately got to switch over to sign. And then do a little rearranging. There are faster ways to get where I got here, if you really know what you're doing. But that's the steps I'll show, because I think those are the most straightforward steps that you'll get there. Then, to get the related acute angle, I do sine inverse of 1 over 1.7. And I get 0 0.55. Need my two pictures. For where sine is positive, it's in this quadrant here and this quadrant here. Me, personally, I don't write the whole cast rule on every single time. I just write the parts I need. You can if you want. So I got my related acute angle 0 0.55. It's there. And it's there. And I get my two answers pi minus 0 0.55 and pi plus 0 0.55 pi minus 0.55 2.59 and pi plus uh, uh, this has got to be uh, 3.69 3 pi plus 0.55 equals 3.69. Yeah, okay, I get that. That's the advanced functions version of that question. This thing asks for it from negative infinity to infinity. So really, the complete answer is 2.59 plus every 2 pi after that. And here, 3.69 and then every 2 pi after that. That's what this other symbol says is I want uh, the answers every 2 pi. Now I'm getting some frowns. Tell me. Oh. 
Oh yeah. Absolutely wrong. <laughs> What's great about my uh, active board? Oops. I accidentally hit re refresh. So here, start it all over again. One over sine x equals 1.7. You can pick it up where I made the mistake and all. I don't think it was there. That was all good. This quadrant and this quadrant. Yes? <laughs> and so, 0 0.55. My two answers are 0 0.55 and pi minus 0 0.55. Two point five nine this time. Better? And so my actual answer, because I want from negative infinity to infinity, is zero point five five plus two pi k every two pi after that. There's lots more answers. And this one, 2.59 plus 2 pi k, every 2 pi after that. Got a little drowsy at the end. Any questions on that? Lots of those practice. So if you're like, yeah, I sort of got it. Uh, I believe there's lots of those practice in the, in the homework for that. Final questions before I start the video?